Mahatma Gandhi once said, there's two types of power in the world. The first obtained through the fear of punishment and the second through acts of love. He believed in love as a force for change and that any power obtained through the fear of punishment was weak, temporary, corrosive to the human spirit, whereas that power enacted through the acts of love was a thousand times more effective and better yet, permanent. I felt that power of love from my father the first time he taught me how to ride a bicycle. His love took the form of patience and I recall how he gently ran beside me, holding, steadying, pushing, gently encouraging me to trust in what he knew was inside of me. I must have failed a hundred times. But then came that moment, as if by some act of magic, my tires righted for the first time. And I remember as a young child, feeling as if I was floating in flight through the heart of the neighborhood. And for that moment, all the things that hung heavy in my young heart, all the things my young mind couldn't understand, my parents' late night fights, their crumbling marriage, the slow moving disease that crept through my mother's body, all of it seemed to disappear that first afternoon. And so it was not long after that that I began a ritual of my own. It began each day after school as I'd hurriedly make my way to my bicycle, grab it from the rack, pedal across my neighborhood, push it beneath the fence, and then cycle deep into the heart of a nearby wildlands in the east of the San Francisco Bay Area. And it was there that I found solace, simply pedaling over dirt through the forest and the trees, because there was something in that simple act of motion atop that equally simple machine of rubber and steel that brought me back to myself. And in that, I was free. But then my life changed as all lives must. And within two years, my parents had argued so much, my father moved out of the house. And I lost interest in that bike. And as it sat dormant, collecting dust in some remote corner of the garage, my mother died in the midst of a bitter divorce. Needless to say, as I was first thrust out in the world as a young man, I spent the first decade of my life angry, bitter, hurting myself, hurting others, the power of love nowhere to be found. But then my father returned to my life. He said to me, I understand. I felt that loss too. And I needed to talk to somebody, and perhaps you should think about that as well. Six months later, I sat before a psychotherapist. I think I'm crazy, I said to her. I thought she'd have me committed. Instead, she looked at me with warm, empathetic eyes, and she said, Rick, the ones who are truly crazy in this world are the ones who are trying very hard to convince you that they're not. That was the beginning of my healing path. And for the next three years, I dug deeply into myself, sometimes looking at parts I didn't want to see. But after that three years period, there came what some people call a moment of clarity, a tipping point, if you will, in which I was able to ask myself one of life's most important questions. What do you want before you die? What is your dream? I had worked 14 years as a daily newspaper photographer, and I knew one thing for sure. That career was no longer feeding me. I had had a larger dream. I had always dreamed to ride a bicycle around the world. And so within a two-year period of time, I found myself sitting on the top of the Golden Gate Bridge on my bike, saying goodbye to friends and family, riding 4,000 miles across America. I pedaled in America 4,000 miles there and moved on to Europe, where I spent eight months cycling through the coldest winter in European record. From there, it was south, 
through Greece and into Turkey. I was denied a visa to come into Iran, so I continued through Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, China, 18,000 feet over the Tibetan Plateau and down into India, Nepal and Bangladesh. And it was there that I began to see something different from the seat of my bicycle, suffering on a level that I'd never seen before. And only then did I learn the second power of love, the first being the care of self, and the second to allow that to be reflected outwards towards service to others. I began volunteering on the time off my bike. The first, the hardest, was comforting the dead and dying in an AIDS hospice in Thailand. That was followed by bomb extraction work in Laos, alongside these gentlemen that extract bombs and keep them from killing anybody else. I followed that up in Vietnam by working alongside mine victim rehabilitation and then taught English to impoverished children in Cambodia. But the reason that I'm here today is to tell you about what happened just after that. I was cycling south through Thailand and I met this gentleman, an Iranian from Mashhad, Iran. We had corresponded by email for a while, Mohammed Tajran was his name, and invited me to come to Penang, Malaysia. Pretty soon I was sitting having coffee and lunch with him. We agreed we'd ride together across Malaysia, across Malaysia's main range, one of the oldest rainforests in the world. And as we rode side by side, I asked him about his life. What he told me was profound. He told me his father had died when he was young and that he'd done everything right in his life, that he got his degree in engineering, opened a successful business, but then as he was climbing a mountain one day, he realized that it just wasn't right. And so he began to plan for a journey. For him, he had a dream to cycle around the world. And as he got ready to do that, he learned English, and uh, then he just set out with 500 bucks in his pocket. Well, that afternoon, what I realized was this man, he was telling my story. That was my story. And I thought to myself, here was this man that people were saying, this is your enemy. When in fact, I had more in common with this man than I had with many of my friends back home. After the end of our ride into the east coast of Malaysia, we dug a hole. He was riding around the world planting trees and we decided to plant a tree together for peace. A tree that still remains and grows for peace between our two countries, America and Iran. And when I said goodbye to Muhammad, I told him that I loved him. And I began to weep. Because I was sorry that our two countries were hurling warlike rhetoric at one another. They were not acting from the power of love, but they were acting from this power they hoped to attain through threats of punishment. And so over the years that I didn't see Muhammad, we developed a second program, it's a project called the Wheels of Peace. And instead of explaining that to you, I'd like to invite him out here to explain it to himself. Muhammad, are you in there somewhere? He got lost on his bike somewhere. Where are you, Muhammad? He's a shy. He doesn't want to come out now. Muhammad, are you back there? I don't know what happened to him. I've been, I've been waiting so long for this moment to hug one of my best friends in front of a crowd in my country, in Iran. I'm so, I'm so excited, so emotional now. Wheels of Peace is a project 
to connect kids from two different nations. They are like two wheels of a bicycle, totally depending on each other. If one doesn't work, the other one would fail. Rick and I are just like a frame, trying to connect them through artworks and letters, and exchanging the, those letters. And let them to understand they have the same values in the whole system. In the same way, in our world, peace is related to the peace of every single nation. As Sadi said, human beings are members of the whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members are uneasy with remain. And so Maham and I visited classrooms in Iran and America, and each one of us we collected artwork and letters to be exchanged by the children. And then we met in Kesh, I can't say the word, Keshem Island, just next door, last year. And we brought that artwork and those letters together. And I guess the thing that I want to finish with is, is what did you learn from all this? And you know, I think it's something that all of you already know, that in our approach every day, moment to moment, we have a choice to operate from what Gandhi spoke of, to operate from that place of love or to operate from that place of fear. And so, what it, for me personally, I think you know the choice. I think you know the choice for Muhammad. But we'll be gone soon enough in so many years and we have the next generation coming. So I'd like to share with you what they had to say to one another with their art and their letters. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.